Miriam, thank you so much for coming and hanging out with me here in Esoterica land. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna dive into some Gamara and some demons, which is like the perfect fit for for Esoterica. But uh, thank you for coming on. Uh, Justin, I am delighted to be here. I truly, truly am. I love your channel, and I'm excited to talk all about Talmud and demons, two of my favorite things in the whole yeah. world. And I'm sure that there won't be any anti-Semitic comments beneath. No, it. of course uh, not. Not even a, a chance. Um, if there are, I will summon demons to deal with that. Yeah, that's that's the way we should fight demons with demons. Right. Um, exactly. So. And ours are better. Yeah, they're way better. Um, tell me a little bit about yourself, um, if you if you don't mind, just introduce and kind of talk about you know your your project Doff Reactions and sort of uh, what you're up to these days. Absolutely. So I am the creator of a Talmud reaction series called Daf Reactions. Uh, I post that on social media. You can find me anywhere. Um, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube at Miriam Anzavin. Um, and what I do in these videos is react to the daily page of Talmud that I am learning, giving my personal thoughts, feelings, emotions, reactions to what I'm encountering on the text of the page from my perspective as a formerly orthodox and now secular millennial woman. Uh, and I came to doing this through uh, the daily learning of Talmud, which is called Daf Yomi, Daf meaning page and Yomi meaning day. It's a process that takes seven and a half years. Every single day, you do one page of the Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud. And then after seven and a half years, you have completed learning the whole thing. So I began learning this with uh, everyone else who began at the new cycle, which was January 5th, 2020. And here I am four and a half years into learning the Talmud, which was something I didn't expect uh, to be doing at this point in my life, but here I am. Here you are, and, and just to lay the land, so you know, some folks are gonna know what the Talmud is, but yes, what is it? Because a lot of people say, well, the Talmud's a commentary on the Bible. And I'm like, you got the commentary part, right? Yeah, there's a lot of commentary, a whole bunch of that, a whole bunch of that. So rabbinic Judaism has the five books of Moses, obviously the Torah and the Tanakh. In addition to that, however, there is something called the oral Torah, which tradition holds, was also given to the Jewish people at Mount Sinai at the same time as the written Torah. And that is traditions that were passed down verbally one generation to the next until um, the Romans happened which was unfortunate for everybody. And I don't care that they made nice roads that doesn't justify anything. Um, and in their destructive zeal in destroying the temple in Jerusalem and Jewish life as it was at the time, well, the, the rabbinic uh, sages of that period, the rabbis had to figure out well, how to preserve Judaism in exile. And one of the things that had to be done uh, was write down what had hitherto been uh, oral traditions and teachings um, in order so they wouldn't be lost. They wouldn't be lost. And so that's what's called the Mishnah. And that was compiled around the year 200 CE-ish. And then you have this other very important component, which is the Gemara. And that is the uh, commentary on the Mishnah from hundreds of rabbis over a long period of time, uh, discussing, analyzing, debating, the things that they are encountering and uh, learning in the Mishnah itself. And that crosses time and space. So you've got multiple generations of rabbis, but also multiple locations because Babylonia became the center of Jewish learning and Jewish life in exile after the Romans came in and, and squished us. So you've got these fascinating conversations that transcend multiple generations, multiple locations, multiple schools of rabbinic thought that do not always agree, rarely agree with each other, I would say rarely being the predominant thing. And it's truly fascinating to look back and see the sages discuss what is present in the Mishnah and try to understand everything that has been written down and hold on to it the best way that they could in what I would describe as a existential crisis of uh, forced diaspora. Right. Yeah, I always try to give the example of what if all the people who celebrated Halloween were about to go extinct and you had to write down all of the ways that right. you celebrate Halloween. Write it so down. Do you have to get a pumpkin? Do you have to carve the pumpkin? If you carve the pumpkin, can have a scary face or a happy face. 
Do you, how do you trick or treat? How much candy do you have to get in order to have trick or treated successfully? Like um, uh, Hilchos this Halloween. Is such an amazing analogy. I would say this is an amazing analogy. The one I often use is that it's ancient Babylonian rabbi Reddit. Yeah. You will have just streams of, of comments back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You will not like all of them necessarily. You'll, some you'll love and will be like life changing. And some you'll be like, well, I firmly, emphatically disagree with that. And that's exactly what you kind of find in the Talmud, which is, I think, why it translates quite well into the digital age. It is a, a hyperlinked, hypertext. yes, it's a hyperlinked document mm -hmm. in a very, you know, understandable sense. No, that's absolutely right. And this is also why people, when you hear someone say something like, the Talmud says, Ugh. you can immediately like close your brain down because yep. everything that's about to come out of their mouth is uh is absolutely uh, ridiculous. rubbish <laughs> right uh, right it's even like if saying, they're right they're wrong they're wrong if the talmud doesn't say anything people say stuff and it's recorded in the talmud so if you say the talmud says bleep 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 dogs are bad i'm god forbid somebody say that but no who who is it who says it right. what rabbi what person said such a horrific statement and what other rabbis said what are you talking about? Okay, Elijah the prophet, we know that he's around because dogs are playing. How dare you? And I think that's kind of one of the things I love the most about learning Talmud is it kind of puts to rest this idea that until the modern era, the modern denominations, uh, there was sort of a singular way of Jewish thought. There was a singular way that people did Judaism and understood Judaism. And the diversity of Jewish thought represented in the Talmud shows that that simply is not the case. So when people say, the Talmud says, you're going to have to get a lot more specific about who it is, what the context is, and who says the counter argument to whatever it was. Right. Yeah, it's, it's a, the, 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 the Talmud is a record of conversations. It is not yeah. a statement of what to do. Exactly. Uh, so yeah, I think that- It's again, not a it's, guidebook. No, no, by no means. And again, when I hear someone say the Talmud says, I'm like, oh, so tell me you've not studied the Talmud Without telling Tell me you saw yeah. a badly designed PDF in a terrible font circulating on Twitter with just a bunch of quotes, right? <laughs> Anti-Semitic quotes from the Talmud. <laughs> that right? might be quotes and might not be quotes. And might be just gibberish. Right. Yeah. And so so just for folks to, to know this, right, because a lot of my audience won't be won't be Jewish. So you're studying this thing every day. Daf Yomi. Oh, is, yeah. Every you're day. doing it every day. Tell me every what. Every single day. Tell me what. Uh, and, uh, tell me. There's two things. One, why in the name of. The Kaddish Baruch Hu, or, or the, you know, Kaddisha Baruch Hi, why in the name of the KBH would you do this to yourself? And, mm. and two, how do you do it? Because I think Great that questions. even if folks don't want to study the Talmud every day, which is reasonable, they might want to study every day. And so yeah. I think that these are this, this is a very transferable yeah. uh, life skill. So one, why in the world did you decide to do this, especially as a person who isn't doing it for religious reasons? I am not. I am and an also, atheist. Yeah. I mean, not that atheists, I'm an, you know, I'm not a theist either, but also I would, I study the Gemara and all this stuff, but there's lots of reasons why to do it, but I'm curious why you're doing it. And then two, how in the world are you making it work? Because yeah. we're so Let busy. We can't yeah. study and uh, you're a busy woman. So I'm curious about how you're, you're, you're fitting that in. Let me go back to my childhood um, because I have to start there <laughs> and explain that I was raised as a, in a Balchuva family. That's a family that became orthodox over time orthodox jewish over time so first we started out secular and then we went to a reform um temple a conservative congregation and then we became even more religious more observant in an orthodox sense stopped driving on shabbat so i went to a chabad house which you will can find literally everywhere and uh spent time in a chabad lubavitch yeshiva for um several years and really really heavily um, in love with Judaism and Jewish learning. Now, the problem was that I am, in fact, a woman, um, and that can be a little bit tricky as to what you have access to learn. So when I was in this school, I will say that we did learn a little bit of Gemara, a little bit of Talmud, but it was really only in specific circumstances. It wasn't an ongoing practice of Talmud learning like it was for the boys in the class. The girls learned Navi, uh, the boys learned Talmud. So I actually had not had this kind of exposure to Talmudic learning 
when I was an Orthodox Jew at all. I was learning a ton of other things. And after I graduated eighth grade in that yeshiva, there was no Orthodox high school for me to go to. Um, so I homeschooled myself until college and went to uh, get my degree in Judaic studies, which I don't know what I was thinking. But it turned out okay in the end. But really, what was I thinking? I had a spiritual crisis, as many people do, um, in my early 20s. And I discovered that God had left the building, which was a deeply upsetting and disturbing and terrifying experience for somebody who had been very, very, very devout. Um, but I thought I would be a disingenuous hypocrite to continue doing anything Jewish. Okay, I was wrong, right? This was my mentality at the age of 20 and 21, a very limited perspective, even though my studies were in Judaic studies and I understood different types of Jewry that exists. To me, at the time, there seemed to only be one way to do it, and that was the Orthodox way I was familiar with. So I stopped doing anything Jewish, uh, except for working at Jewish nonprofits because I had to do something with, <laughs> with that above, degree. <laughs> That's right. And it was at just such a nonprofit that I heard um, during a lunch and learn, and I joke, this is the only lunch and learn in human history that actually I can confirm changed someone's life because it was mine. Our guest was Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs of Blessed Memory, who was the chief rabbi uh, of the UK. And he spoke about something called Dafiomi. And he talked I mean, if anyone has ever heard him speak, heard him, or read any of his books, the inspirational, it's off the charts, okay? If you're not inspired, are you alive? So he talked about Dafyomi, this process of seven and a half years of learning every single day, you being on the same page, literally, with Jews who lived half the world away from you, lived completely different lives from you, spoke different languages, different experiences entirely than yourself. But every single day, you would meet together on that page for seven and a half years. And to me, and I feel it right now, like my hair, I feel it kind of stand up a little bit because in that moment I realized there is a way for me to still engage with my Jewish identity and not cut myself off from it. And that's learning. I'm already a self-directed learner. Anybody who's homeschooled themselves would describe themselves thusly. Um, and for me, it was a moment of possibility. Here is a path that I can walk on where I won't feel like a disingenuous hypocrite. I'm learning, I'm learning about our past. I'm understanding the context of so many things in Judaism that directly we pull from the Talmud or are inspired by things in the Talmud. And I'm not gonna lie, there was also part of me that's like, you know, I've heard so many anti-Semitic things about the Talmud. I would like to see for myself what's in it. I'm going to do this. And I remember emailing my mother, who is still an observant Orthodox woman, that night being like, crazy thought. I think I might do Daf Yomi. So we get closer to the actual news cycle beginning. Again, so that's January of 2020. And right before that happens, during the holiday of Hanukkah that year, which is all about rededication, there was a series of really horrific anti-Semitic attacks in New York, including famously a machete attack. Um, at someone's Hanukkah gathering. And I thought to myself, no one is going to identify me as a Jewish person other than, you know, at my workplace. No one is going to know that I am part of this people. I want to firmly plant myself here and say, I am a Jew as well. And I'm going to do it by learning the Talmud every single day for seven and a half years. And I say that this is my seven and a half year fuck you to anti-Semites. So this is a combination of joy, the joy of Jewish learning, and oi, which the eternal Jewish, you know, dichotomy, the oi of this being also a response, uh, a personal response to anti-Semitic hatred. So that's why I began Davyomi. And I remember those first few days, uh, it's really, it throws you in the deep end. And there's a lot of enthusiasm at the beginning. You know, everyone's seen everybody completing this seven and a half years. There's this huge, massive party. Everyone gets really amped. They get really hyped about it. Um, and I saw so many different groups across the spectrum of the Jewish experience. LGBTQ, Talmud study, uh, Dafyomi groups, um, uh, Jewish women, Orthodox women groups, um, Hold on, let me restart that sentence. 
there were so many different types of Jews who had Daf Yomi learning groups. You had LGBTQ Daf groups, you had Orthodox women's Daf groups, any type of group who wanted to get in on this learning. And that was a really inspirational, amazing part. And it helped to begin with that energy because sometimes people have that energy coming in and then they hit some of the things that I love about the Talmud, but they might feel a little bit too out there, a little bit too extreme. So like page, or I, I believe it's like five or six, you start with the demons, you start mm -hmm. getting the demons. And I was like, I love this. This is going to be my life now. And some other people are like, I think I'm tapping out. But for me, that was the thing that sealed the deal. I was fascinated. I was riveted. I'm like, this is going to be my whole life. So every single day, I spend uh, time learning it on Safaria, which is an amazing resource. I cannot recommend highly enough, uh, providing free uh, translated Jewish texts. It's a digital library of Jewish text. So that is a massive part of my learning. I listen because I am not actually um, fluent in Aramaic, despite my deep wishes to be so. I listen to um, a talk, a class given by Rabbanit Michelle Farber, who is a groundbreaking female Talmud scholar. And I have a Chavruta, who I also learn with as well. And some videos of him and I learning, uh, I post to show what it is actually like to learn in Chavruta, which means paired learning, a classic way of learning Talmud. And I think uh, one of the most enjoyable types of learning one can do. We have so much fun, even when the, the learning is difficult, the process of learning together with somebody is deeply rewarding. Mm -hmm. It takes time, I'm not gonna lie to you. It takes time to do the learning every single day to make sure that you're blocking out the time required. Some dapim, some pages are shorter, some are longer. It really depends. Some are deeply complex uh, about law, Jewish law, halacha. Some are fun stories that go past very fast. It, it really depends on what tractate, what subject, what topic we're on, um, what's going on in that part of the Dafyomi cycle. So then what happened is that two years after beginning Dafyomi and learning it through the first two years of the pandemic, and also lurking on TikTok for those same years, I decided, well, what if I just made a few little reaction videos to the Talmud? Because all I see when I search Talmud on TikTok is anti-Semitic conspiracy theories about what the Talmud is. I don't see anybody who's learning it in good faith, talking about it and engaging with it like that. So I decided, okay, I'm going to make some little reaction videos and like two to five people are going to see them, but it'll be a really great way for me to try and remember what I'm learning a little bit better and to do something creative and artistic with it. And so I started making this series that I didn't really have an idea of what I was doing, but I was like, this is Daf Reactions. Today we're talking about this page. And then I would talk about my thoughts, feelings, emotions, reactions to whatever I was encountering. And I would mix in pop culture references that helped me understand the text, current events, personal life things that I could relate to that mm -hmm. connected me back through time to that. And all of a sudden, about a month after I started making these little videos, people started to notice. And that's when my life significantly changed. And here I am on your channel. That and demons. So we'll, we'll, <laughs> that and demons. <laughs> yeah, we'll get to the demons in, in a second. Yeah. Um, like any any like tips or tricks for like how you incorporate this into your life? Because you go from sort of like you said zero to a hundred in terms oh, of yeah. studying, uh, and the first few dafim of the first tractate Berachot are not until you get to the demons, and you know they're just yeah. kind of boring. How do you know when you can do morning prayers? They're right. They're topical, I guess, in some sense, but yeah. they're not terribly. You know, I would not say they're thrilling. But like, how do you, you know? How do you incorporate daily study into your life? Do you do it at one time of the day? Do you? Yeah. Uh, do you what? What's your what's your tips and tricks? What's so your life hacks for Gamar? I am. Oh, this is a good question. Uh, it can vary when I study during the day. My brain works best in the morning when my chavruta and I study. It's at seven thirty in the morning, which gets both the most um, insightful and also hilarious results because I'm not quite quite awake necessarily, but the br the brain is cooking and we get some very interesting thoughts on the Talmud then. Um, I do think it's important to set aside time every day. You have to factor this into your schedule. Now, some people I know 
um, I read about this will actually have like commuter gatherings on a train on a commuter rail into New York and they have their little DAF group and they learn on the commute. And some people will listen to a podcast like Robin E. Michelle Farber's podcast, the Hadron podcast, and they'll do that while they're driving. Um, it is a difficult thing to manage. I will say I have missed learning the DAF thrice in the four and a half years. And all three times was because I had a migraine, which incidentally, there is a demon of migraines who I blame. Who I directly okay. blame for that. I, I went back and learned those pages as soon yeah. as I was able to. But it does take a commitment. You have to understand that you're blocking off time during the day to do this. And usually for me, um, unless it's a very complex and really, really deep uh, discussion that needs more attention and more time to understand, for me, it's about 45 minutes to an hour mm -hmm. of learning every single day. And that was hard when I had full-time job that was not talking about Talmud on the internet. Once that became my job, I made that my job, then it became a lot easier because it is in fact <laughs> what I do all the time. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, I feel the same. People are like, how do you read all this stuff? I'm like, what else? This is kind of what I do. This is, this is who I am now, yeah. which was quite a plot twist. I did not foresee this as being that thing that I'm known for. That's the that's the woman who does Talmud on TikTok. She's the one who does Daf Yomi on Instagram. This was not a plot twist I expected. Hey, you know, uh, I can say the same thing about my life, and uh, I ain't complaining. It's a pretty good uh, as plot twists go. There there are far worse ones. It just, there's no. the falling down the stairs one. I'm glad I'm not in that one. I I um, feel very lucky. Yeah, it's a pretty I'm very grateful. A pretty pretty good life. Uh, yeah. The life of of life of study. Yes. Um, and I think even in the Gemara, isn't there like an incantation to get rid of migraines? To get rid of it's Polga, it right? It worked. Alas, yeah. <laughs> it has not worked. I will say, in addition to the fascinating demonology of the Talmud, there's also a lot of medical advice that I beg nobody to take. No, Please, no. God, don't take no. any of the medical advice That's listed the in the Talmud. And if you do, don't tell us about it. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, especially like a bunch of dudes thinking about how women's bodies work. It's just like, have you seen one of their bodies? Like, they're like, I've heard a woman can give birth to a bird. And you're like, huh, guys? <laughs> um, One of the, should... oh my goodness. The, I find it deeply, it, of course there's, um, the misogyny is rampant, rampant. Yeah. And if one approaches it with a comedic lens, it's also hilarious. Right. So I will say there's one page that I, I remember thinking this is so sexist and also thinking this is the funniest thing I've ever read in my life. And it's Shabbat 110. So tractate Shabbat, uh, page 110. And the discussion is what happens? Okay. What happens if a snake sees a woman has desires towards her, as we know, snakes generally do, um, and wants to hook up with her, wants to literally slither in to her vagina. This is a real question that is debated. And there, there are several ideas that are suggested. First, tell, tell it you're on your period, okay? Leave you, leave you alone. You're on your period. Second, have sex with your husband so it'll get the hint that you're already taken. But if none of this is effective and the snake somehow does slither into you, what to do then? Good question. Good traumatic question. Well, then you sit outside with your legs spread because you're going to do a very interesting technique here and somebody has to do some barbecuing of some meat and the snake is going to stick its head out of your vagina and go wait is something cooking and at that moment you take tongs you grab it you pull it out and you throw that snake on the fire and i'm laughing i'm laughing because it's so ludicrous and ridiculous and at the same time it's horrible but this is part of the way to get through the challenging sexism one does encounter one also finds moments that are surprisingly feminist or proto-feminist um, that are quite surprising, but I'm glad that they're there, which helps offset the other things that are right. also there. Yeah, yeah, like a uh, forget which rabbi it is who's like really pro uh, cosmetic use. Like he's Rav, all about Rav Chista. Is, is Rav Chista, yeah, of course, Rav Chista. Yeah, like this he's is like the video all about. That, uh, yeah, he's all about like no women should beautify themselves, like you know, like. Even the you know dudes should beautify themselves. Yeah, it's a, it's oh, a well. funny. Um, Yochanan, Yochanan Ben Zakkai, who was like, 
No, I have to wear perfume all the time. I, like, I need to, I need what to are you be talking about. Yeah, I love, I love, yeah, I love those. Love the again, like those tales as well are so. They're um, so good. They're so great. If we're talking about you know beauty, I think of nobody uh, except Rabbi Yochanan, notoriously the hottest person who ever lived in the Talmud. Um, he thought that, and everybody else also thought that. And I love that for both him and for us. Uh, I think of all the people, the figures, the characters I've encountered in the Talmud. Rabbi Yochanan is up there as one of my absolute favorites, absolute favorites. Oh, he's lovely. He's, he's such a, a vibe. Yeah, he's great. Yeah, I love that the stuff about him. Like, uh, I can't remember the Aramaic word that describes him, but he's, um, uh, yeah, I can't remember exactly the word, but it's like he's he he has a a, spe- a specific disposition. He's like sensitive in a way. Yeah. Uh, especially about his his looks, oh, and it's yeah. like and, and all the rabbis are like, yeah, that's his thing. Like, don't bother him about that. That's his thing. <laughs> yeah, like, that's his like, thing. Yeah. Everyone just acknowledge that you are inferior. Right. Like he's hot. Every, like he's like, hot. Yeah. Like you you need to just be okay with that. It's uh, and it's some people deal. are bitter about it. And they're like, he's oh, yeah, not they're... that hot. He has no beard, and because yeah. they're jealous. It's true. It's true. Yeah, there, um, there's always salty people out there. Yes, it's the, the haters. It's you know, it's true. Do. So what brings you into esoterica land is the shadim, the mazikim, the, yes. the, the demons, and I, I love to hear the fact that uh, that you know what got you sort of, you know, what what got you latched on to you know season one of of the Gamara is uh, is the shadim and. Yeah. Um, you know, again, like one of the things that we inherit from our sort of broader non-Jewish culture is like we get their demons. It's right. like the exorcist demons. We get the right. demons of like, you know, it's it's basically Catholic demons is kind of right. what we get, which I don't know. How did you, you know, when you sort of encounter the demons of the Talmud uh, and there are different kinds of demons and they do all kinds of different things. But, yeah. you know, how did how did those what about them grabbed you? Like what about them when you first oh. started learning about them? What are some of the things that are like, hold on, this is fun and interesting and and I'm, I'm i'm about this shade of life uh i'm gonna say they're so deeply relatable not every single demon but the representation of demons in the babylonian talmud is as you say so significantly different from the sort of broader cultural understanding that we um, are familiar with it's not the demons that are here to drag you to hell, right? That's not the vibe they're giving. That's not what they're about. It's quite different. It's almost like they share aspects between humans and angels, and they're sort of like in a midpoint. They are intermediary beings in the same way angels are, but they share attributes, aspects um, with both humans and angels. So like angels they fly real fast you know they've got wings they have the ability to know what's going to happen in the future they have one might say magical or miraculous abilities or capabilities at times and they are um they are they fit into the uh sort of system the hierarchy created by god they don't work for the devil they're not here to try to you know corrupt humanity that's not their that's not their thing they fit a certain role in the cosmos mm-hmm. that Hashem, that God has created, just like angels do, and just like human beings do. And like human beings, they need to eat, they need to uh, drink, they, they reproduce, and they also pass away, which is something that angels don't really do at all. But I think the thing that I love so, so much about the demons in the Talmud is how how petty they can be in like a deeply relatable way they need personal space basically if you are a person who would go up to a wild and if you're going to go up to a bison and take a selfie with it and you're like oh my god it killed me why i think you know why and the talmud's basic idea overall generally speaking is that if you leave if you leave and the talmud's basic idea is overall if you leave demons alone they will leave you alone. Mm-hmm. Stay out of their lane and they will stay out of your lane. Don't uh, invade their personal space. You need to give four cubits of personal space. Give me that space and then you'll be all right. Now, some are malevolent, definitely, and some are genuinely good, upstanding members of society, which I love. It's like a mirror reflection of human beings. Mm-hmm. Some are great. Some are absolute trash. 
And that doesn't make human beings as a whole evil, and it doesn't make them as a whole good either. It makes them complex. It makes them interesting. It makes them anti-heroes, heroes sometimes. They, I think, are the most fascinating and nuanced supernatural characters, if we want to say it that way, that we encounter in mm -hmm. the Talmud. And there's so much about them that I find relatable on a personal level. And I know some people might say, well, look, she's terrible. What does that say about people. Miriam? <laughs> <laughs> I also like personal space. I also like people not to invade my privacy. I also will get mad if you cross boundaries. It's, it's understandable. It's understandable. It's relatable. And, you know, I salute them. Yeah, Have I, boundaries. I, I... Yeah, I agree. And it's interesting that, you know, there's there's a sense, like you said, that you have to keep your distance from them. But also it's interesting that the, the Gemara will say things like, if you could see them, that's all you could see. That they're like, there's so many of them. Oh, um, yeah. There's this idea. I believe it's Rav Huna who says this, I think, uh, who says every single one of us, every single one of us has 10,000 demons on our right and 1,000 demons on our left. You're just lucky that they are currently invisible. Now, not yeah. all demons are invisible, but they happen to be right now because I'm not, oh my God, it's right there. Um, but there's that say, you're constantly, you're constantly surrounded by them. And so this is part of why the sages of the Talmud are trying to figure out what is the best way to interact with these forces that happen to exist in the same area that we exist. What's the best way to handle this? How do we remain safe? How do we respect the, their space and make sure that we are okay? And I just find that absolutely riveting. Yeah, I totally agree. It's, I, I've pitched a couple of movie ideas where uh, rather than assuming the Christian demonology, we assume the right. Jewish demonology. And they're just yeah. around. They're just and, like, living their lives. Yeah, they're just around here. Like they're just in there, you know, doing their thing and we're doing our thing. And sometimes we we intersect. And it's it's the moment of the sort of comedy of horrors where we intersect and we like don't know what to do with one another. Right. Uh, they're like, was, um, and we're like, um, they're like, uh, this is uncomfortable. Like, hold I'll on. That why are you in my bathroom? Like, why are <laughs> right. you in my bathroom? Right. Yeah. This, so this brings us to the bathroom demons, the bathroom uh, demons. which is such a fascinating concept, but it, it's understandable. Mm -hmm. Obviously at the time they, there was no indoor plumbing. Nobody had the safety of just walking to their bathroom in their house. You had to go to an outhouse in the dark. No one had flashlights. They hadn't been invented yet. And so you might meet a wild animal. You might meet a person who wishes you ill on your journey in the darkness, bumping into things, and maybe a demon. These are dangerous places. Maybe a wild animal is there. A snake is there to try to crawl inside you or bite you or whatever. Danger happens in abandoned spaces or not really inhabited spaces. And because bathrooms weren't in the house, they were outside, that becomes one of the quandaries what to do when you would need to go to the bathroom but there is a demon in the bathroom currently and they have no intention of leaving and one of the most iconic stories about this well there are several i'm going to tell you a few so one that i truly love is about um the sage rava often quoted often quoted uh throughout the gemara and he um and his wife had very specific bathroom rituals to make sure he was protected from demons. And I do want to mention that demons, generally speaking, again, generally speaking, in the Talmud don't target women as much as they target men. Men are more at risk from demon problems. And maybe that's because women also like personal space and, you know, respect that. That's just a theory. But anyway, so in order to make sure that her husband was safe from the demons, his wife, Rava's wife, would go in and rattle, do a rattle inside the bathroom to be like, hey, it's like when you take your dog outside and there might be a skunk and you're just like, we're coming out, just everyone be aware, okay? She would rattle this rattle so that he could go to the bathroom in privacy. And I think also it provided white noise coverage. And then when he became the leader of one of the academies, uh, well, now the risk was even greater. So they cut a window into the bathroom wall and she would stick her hand in and rest her hand upon his head while he was using the bathroom. And that I think should be the definition of traditional marriage. If you're Real not love. doing that, right. Is your marriage traditional? No. And I, so I, I truly love that story. For all the trad wives out there. Trad where, wives, where's your, where, where's your window rest, into the bathroom? Right, where, right, right. Are you in there while your husband is pooping? And if so, if not, why not? You're, you're let him be endangered by the shadum. 
That's right. You're just leaving yeah. your husband to be vulnerable in there. Yeah, you're not really being trad. Right, right. <laughs> Poser. Um, but the other, I think, iconic story about protecting oneself in the uh, bathroom against demons who happen to be in there um, is about Abaye, who, interestingly enough, is one of Rava's contemporaries, and they often are in discussion and arguments with each other on various issues. But there's this famous story that Rava's mom or adoptive mom, but mom, he calls her mother, so it's his mom, uh, gave him a lamb, a pet lamb, to accompany him into the bathroom in order to make sure he wasn't alone in there so he would be safe from the demons. And I often joke there should be lamb amulets or lamulets widely available so people can bring that into their bathroom. Rava and his lamb being a very iconic story of how to avoid how to protect against bathroom demons. So also it's interesting because there is a specific, you know, this is a thing that's true of, of lots of spaces. There are specific demons of certain things and we can talk about some of those, but there is a specific bathroom demon. He's like in charge of the bathroom demonizing. Uh, yes. It's a great Bar name. Sharika Panda. Yeah. And who may be associated with uh, a sort of uh, not Jewish demon idea but definitely we have a variant of him in the talmudic tradition and he is the demon of bathrooms and i think somebody should have a bar called bar sharika panda or a panda named bar sharika panda um, these are missed opportunities if nobody is doing this but yes there are named named demons associated with specific areas or specific um even uh agricultural things like there's certain uh, that are associated with caper bushes or different right. types of trees. There's all kinds of different demons in different locations and different um, that serve different functions. Right. And also it's interesting that the Chatham don't even all get along. It's not in the Gemara. No. I think it's in the Midrash where there's a story where there's a demon inside of a well and another oh, yeah. demon comes to that and comes in and says to someone sitting, well, look, there's a bad demon here. I'll yeah. help you drive them out. If you let me live here, I'm not a bad demon. I'll, I'll like, right. And the idea of like using demons against one another is a classic idea going back to Pazuzu and stuff like that. Yeah. But uh, any of these demons that like really jump out at you as like favorite, you know, Ashmedai. Ashmedai. Agri, but, Ride or die for Ashmedai. Okay. Oh, That's so, my whole vibe right he's now. He's so pious. He's so <laughs> like, he's such a good guy. They like, they just have to like man, get him drunk and manhandle him into, into yes. Jerusalem. Cause he's like, no, I don't do that. I'm above so, that. Let me tell you that I, I told the story last year when we got to it in the Talmud cycle. It was in Tractate, in Tractate Gitin. Mm -hmm. And this story captured my attention so much, and I loved it so much, that I developed a spin-off series for Daff Reactions, which I'm launching in September, called Jewish Lore Reactions. Because this one encounter, this initial encounter between King Solomon and King Ashmedai that is detailed in this truly epic and fascinating story i know that it carried on and more permutations and variations of this tale appeared in later midrash in later folk tales and songs and art all it just across the diaspora and i thought to myself well this is this is fascinating here we have two characters two interactions that uh we've met them as interacting with each other in this in our in our old texts the mm -hmm. talmud in this case and then we can trace how these stories developed and evolved as characters, as stories, down through time across the diaspora into different communities. So what I'm doing with Jewish lore reactions is I'm beginning again with this very tale and then following it out to discover the expanded lore of Ashmedai and Solomon, because there's a lot more connections between them than one might think that involves mm -hmm. Agrat, who you just right. mentioned. I right. don't want to spoil it too much please tune in to the show. But I will say there's a few things about Ashmedai that I love that come out of this story. The first thing is that in this tale, as opposed to normally we think of Solomon always being represented as super wise, right? He know, He's the wisest person. In this story, he is not wise and he is not pious. The person who is wise and pious mm -hmm. is Ashmedai, oh. king of the demons. In fact, every single day in the story, he spends his time schlepping between learning uh, here on earth in the Beit Midrash, in the Hall of Learning, and heaven, where they also have 
Beit Midrash, but they also have several Beit Midrashim, actually, uh, Houses of Learning in Heaven, which uh, goes to show that actually demons have functions that they fulfill in heaven. They are not kicked out of heaven. They are actually welcome to go learn there. They have mm -hmm. roles there. Uh, and in a similar way, you also learn that angels have roles in Gehenna, right? It's actually mm -hmm. not run by demons. And the, and the angels very... are all, almost always way more frightening. They, oh god yeah, they're terrifying yeah, angels are terrifying i'd much rather absolutely deal with than, i would than rather meet a demon yeah. i think fascinatingly agrat who you mentioned who mm -hmm. is one of the demon queens a truly incredible character um and ashmanai's mom according to traditions um she it rolls deep with a gang right she's a gang leader but who is her squad it is not a bunch of demons it's 180,000 angels of destruction right this is an intersectional queen, right? She's got, a, it's not a demonic force that rolls with her. It's angels and they're terrifying. Yeah. They're so terrifying and she is at their head, but it's not like it's a bunch of demons. It's a angel demon coalition. And I respect that about her. But in this particular tale about Ashmedai, he is pious. He is smart. He is captured by Solomon because Lots of reasons you'll have to watch the series to right. discover the nitty gritty of that tale. The Shamir. Right, the Shamir. Yeah. Like, yes, uh, I will talk about that. It's forever. a magic no. worm, folks. It's a magical it worm. It was uh, later, yes, understanding, current understanding is that it right. is a magical worm that can cut through stone, and Solomon needed it to build the temple because he right. couldn't use anything made out of metal. God said, no metal. We're not doing that. You got to figure out another way. Magic worm it is. Magic worm. Yeah. But so who knows where it is? Ashmedai. So Solomon right. captures Ashmedai. And in their interactions, we see how much Tanakh, how much Torah Ashmedai knows and quotes, how he is um, shown to be more responsible towards literally everything than Solomon, who keeps him waiting for three days because Solomon is drunk and he ate too much and he needs to sleep it off. And he's shown as wise. Uh, he tricks Solomon into freeing him and dropkicks Solomon 400 miles away. <laughs> It's like a Marvel movie. It's incredible. Usurps yeah. his role. He's basically pulling a Loki. He's right. pulling a Loki um, and Odin from the end of Thor the Dark World and the beginning of Thor Ragnarok, right? So uh, Ashmedai is actually sitting on the throne. And that story, there's a lot of other things that happen, but that story ends with a choose your own adventure. One sage says that Solomon was able to come back and reclaim his throne. And another one says... No, he never came back. And the person sitting on the throne was Ashmedai all along. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, it's such a That's why interview. he was so wise, because it wasn't Solomon. It wasn't Solomon. Yeah. And people also don't know that, like, also so much of the history of magic tied to King Solomon is oh, derivative yeah. of these of these stories about Solomon and Ashmedai and, and the construction of the temple and his ring yeah. that gives him all these powers and stuff Ma like that. Ma yep. The yep. magical ring with the tetragrammaton, the mm -hmm. all-powerful name of God upon it, which in this story, Solomon also stupidly gives up and Ashmanai swallows it and he's like, that was stupid. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a, it's a very powerful rite. So we've got a very powerful magical symbol um, that is used throughout these different stories that I tell in the series and Jewish mm -hmm. law reactions. One of the categories of topics, in addition to these fascinating characters, is also wielders of the name of God. Right that works right. in a very magical way. You can use it, those who can say it and pronounce it and use it, which is only the few, the holiest people, um, can use it to do a lot of things that are clearly magical. It is an incantation of sorts. Um, you can chain demons with it. You can command things to happen with it. You can protect against external persecution with it. Right. You can also teleport with it if you need to. Um, several characters come to mind about that and this is going to be a crazy sentence because i'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say the two that immediately come to mind are lilith and the Baal Shem tov who are very different yep. very different characters very True. different but there are stories of both using the name to teleport right, right. yeah and uh, even there's a great story in the book of enoch where you know the the angels come down from heaven to try to sleep with human women right and the because the, you know, earth girls are easy and um and the first woman they come to, uh, she's like, well, I'll sleep with you if you tell me God's name. Uh, and uh, Shimyaza says, okay. And so he says, you know, he tells her God's name. And then she says it out loud and she's immediately transformed into the Pleiades and escapes. 
and i love the idea that's that smart. The, the stoop these stupid angels come down to have sex with women and the first women they encounter trick them immediately uh and they're like it, it just you just get the sense of just like horny teenagers yeah um like yeah. they're not there yeah, again we have the we have all these presuppositions about angels and demons that we get for, largely from sort of christian hegemony yeah. but when you get into actually you know jewish tales that it, so much of this is topsy-turvy when it comes to these um these oh, stories and so agrod is a great example of a yeah. character um you know lilith gets all the airtime because we, lilith we all... gets all the seo let me yeah. just go on a mini rant for a hot second go. this is what i gotta say yep. in researching this project I did, I read so many books and so many articles and Googled so much. And you know what was a big challenge to me because I wanted to be able to represent stories that included female characters. Mm -hmm. Lilith ate all the SEO. All of it. She gets Anytime, all the screen time. She gets all the screen time. And you know, the truth is she is one of the oldest figures that we have that pre-existed beyond the Jewish um, mm -hmm. uh, understanding of her. So I want to acknowledge that, that she had previous um iterations versions in cultures that were not babylonian jewish but she is a big deal a big a big deal she's the biggest of the big bads um mm. if we want to think about it that way she's also a very interesting and complex character um but i actually forgot what the question was because oh right i'm going on a rant about lilith hold on <laughs> <laughs> you forgot your own rant That's i forgot impressive. my own rant so she's a very interesting and complex character and I understand why everyone is so fascinated by her, but the pop culture saturation of Lilith, as a, you know, Lilith, not as many people know Agrat. Yeah, Agrat. Not I as mean, many people know Nama, right? right? You don't get that kind of attention. Lilith gets the attention. That's her real sin, everybody. That's her real sin, stealing focus. <laughs> so my chat, it's not really about her, but it's about the fact that she has captured the imagination of people mm -hmm. so strongly that it's almost impossible to search beyond her unless you really do the work to discover female Jewish uh, legendary characters that you want to talk about who aren't Lilith. Right, right. So this is my personal beef with Lilith and why uh, I'm going to be talking quite a bit about Agrat and several other very important female characters that are not Lilith, although I also will be talking about Lilith. Because of course, you can't yeah. Not you can't not, yeah. I mean... But yeah, I mean, Agra, but Machalat is like, in many ways, I think she's far, I mean, she's the queen of the demons, first of all. So like Lilith is a daughter of hers in some sense, uh, or depending on who tells depending the story. Depending on, yeah, depending yeah, on when depending the story on, is told and who is telling right. it. Yeah. Right. And, uh, but, but Agra is so much more frightening in the sense that like, before her encounter with, uh, oh, what's his name? Uh, uh, Rabbi Hanina Bendosa. Right, right. Who, 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 who miracles happen to his wife daily, which I love that he I accidentally miracled. <laughs> Like she's like another miracle happened. Like that was the first off reactions video I did actually. Was really, a story about his wife. Oh, his, yeah. it's such a great. They're such a power couple. They're a power couple. Um, I describe him as the Steve Irwin of the Talmud. Steve Irwin of blessed memory. That. Yeah, he's accidentally uh, amazing. But like, he's he also is the goat. Like he will right. deal with dangerous situations that other people would fear to deal right. with. And one dangerous situation is, is encountering Agrat, and restricting her. So usually she just wrote out and like she was dancing on rooftops. This is something we know her for um, and just creating absolute havoc. And he's like, okay, no, you can't do that anymore. We can't do that. And she's like, no, you got to leave me sometimes. Okay. There's a, like a little negotiation they have where she's like, if I didn't already know from heaven that you were an incredible Torah scholar, but I do know that um, I would have already just like, poof, blasted you out of the way but i can't do that because i know that you're a torah scholar and you're respected and in this paradigm right this is not Lilith talking this is me talking in this paradigm that the babylonian talmud sets up demons are aware of jewish law and often mm -hmm. operate within it they operate within it so she she knows that heaven thinks he's great she spent a lot of time up there one assumes that's where she you know met and first got to know the 180,000 angels that mm -hmm. ride with her every night so she knows about Rabbi Hanita Mendoza, and she says to him, if I didn't know about you, I would have already done some bad stuff to you, but I can't. So they have this negotiation. So he restricts her. Okay, you get Friday nights and you get Tuesdays, but the rest of the time, no. So that's how it ends up being. She's got partial, partial rights 
to her demonic activities right. and the rest of the time she can't yeah and it's interesting uh, fridays and tuesdays like it's interesting that she can rampage i guess on fridays like we're you know, we're indoors and it's shabbat time so we're right. fine but it's interesting tuesdays i, I always like I it's a fascinating I, it's a fascinating yeah, why tuesdays i mean yeah. I'm, I'm wondering and this is speculative uh if it has to do with which days i was gonna say which days the torah are read but yeah it, yeah read torah monday and then it's not that you know, yeah that doesn't correlate at all yeah who knows it could Further be some research weird, weird babylonian stuff to too it's you know, yeah the, this is also like the the it, this is the thing also folks may not know is that the there's another talmud the jerusalem talmud and yeah, boring it's, it's hey look if you're where into are the demons hey lots of agriculture in babylon jerusalem talmud if you like you know how to divvy, divvy up a you know parcel of land that's you know yeah, Ribbon. but not so much with the demons. Yeah. Um, not so much with the demons. Uh, and again, this is one of these funny stories that you know, we talked about a little bit earlier about in Pesachim, where you know if you're doing things in pairs can oh, attract yeah. demons. Um, and they go on and on and on about this for yeah. you know how you like can count a cup and look at a beam of a, of a, of your right. house and you look down and so you're not actually doing things in pairs because every time you look up or look out the window you break the cycle of counting and therefore right. it's not pairs of things. I love the this. And, and there's a great yeah. moment in the end where they're like, it's, you know, someone's like, yeah, and they're at this trail. We don't care about this. Right. Like, uh, like, Rav Demi you, is like, yeah. what are you guys doing? We what don't do this. this. Yeah. So, what are you guys up to? And they're like, what What are you talking about? This is vitally important things you to do know. You stuff in pairs? My God. <laughs> That's dangerous. That is, you are not prepared for what's going to happen to you. Yeah, it's very, very interesting. And, and also, Ashmedai is referred to as the person who is in charge, the demon who is in charge of pairs, mm -hmm. right? which I think is fascinating um, and also associates math with demons, which in my mind is terror. It makes them even more terrifying. And the one of the things I don't like about him is math. Um, <laughs> but cause math terrifies me, but I think it's just so fascinating. They're like, don't do things in pairs, right? Don't do it. So when at the Passover table, famously, you drink four cups of wine at the Seder, but four is an even number. So exactly. What do you do? You drink one and one and one and one. That does not equal four. It means one and one and one and one. Okay. <laughs> different. That's completely different. And the demons will never know that. Right. Yep. Yeah. And you can say that little rhyme they have in there too, uh, where if you do say it, you can say, I forget how the rhyme goes, but you burst a demon open. It's a fun right. little Right. Um, and this is also a thing people don't realize is that not only could we talk about like Shadim being a lot in the Gemara, but also we mentioned earlier, like the demon, the migraine demon, Palga. Um, there's also incantations Nemesis. all over. Yeah. Palga, the. Yeah. In Aramaic, there... it means the split. What a terrifying. And that is an um, accurate description. Yeah. So accurate. But there are all these like yeah. interesting, you know, Shabiri, the, the demon of night blindness. You can yeah. say his name and subtract one letter at a time and make him disappear yeah. by. I make, right. Exactly. Yeah. So Which I've tried with people I don't like. I don't know if it's effective for me. If but... you say their name and subtract like one letter <laughs> just... until they go away. Right. Exactly. Exactly. But if you just did that to their face, they would be so confused. They'd be like, what are you doing? I'm yeah. Like, I'm, I'm doing... channeling demon energy. Okay. Yeah, this leave is, me cause... alone. Yes, exactly. Leave me alone. Right. <laughs> Get out of my face. Stay in your lane. You'll be fine. Come into my lane. You will not be. Yeah, it is very, very, very interesting. Yeah. Any last fame, you know, favorite stories, demon or otherwise, in the Gemara? What's, oh. you know, we, there's always the oven of Achnei or, or, you know, we could always go to, you know, that's, I feel like that one no one gets to say is their favorite because. I t that I will say, if there's any Daf Reaction video anybody out there watches from me. I think my oven of Achnei video is the one of which I am the proudest. I think that when I'm done with that series, I will look back and I'm like, well, I, I did that. I did my job. That is the best work I've ever done in a Daf Reactions uh, video. The Oven of Achnei being the most famous story right. in the Talmud. I don't think there's any argument about that. It is the yeah. most famous story in the Talmud in which basically the sages are like, shh, heaven, you gave the Torah to us. Shh, shut it. Okay. You gave it to us to interpret. That's our job now. Stop interceding. Um, and it's just fascinating for several reasons, that being the primary one, but also because I have personal beef with one of the sages represented here, which is uh, Rabbi Eliezer ben Harkonnes, who mm. famously said, if you teach a woman Torah, you are teaching her to be licentious or you're teaching her to be ridiculous or, or some people will say uh, a whore. If you teach 
a woman Torah, this, if you teach your daughter Torah, right. Tiflut is the word that is used. So I've got beef with him, and he's the guy in the story of Akni, who all the other sages disagree with too. I'm glad to know that I'm in good company. No one likes him. And he's trying to convince everybody that this oven is uh, ritually pure. And they're like, no. So he calls upon, right? He calls upon inanimate objects around him to back up his statement. He's like, this stream will say, will agree with me. And it starts flowing backwards. And they're like, that's not good. That's not a proof text. Okay, buddy, calm down. Um, uh, the uh, He gets a carob tree to move. He gets the walls of the Beit Midrash to start to collapse. And finally, a voice, a bot coal from heaven says, he's right. And the rest of the sages are like, no. Lo bashamayim he. Yeah. It is not in heaven. Yeah. And then um, some other drama happens. But it's a very famous story because it is at its heart about why Rabbi Leazar Ben Harkness sucks, but also about the importance of human beings interpreting the law that they have to live. Right. Yeah. And I, and also, you know, we, we always read half that story and we don't read the yeah. rest of it where things go the, pretty badly for him. Oh <laughs> my God. That's like, the that's, best that's, part of it. It's the best part. It's like, yeah. Like if we're going to read the, the story, read the whole, the yeah. whole thing, because it does not, you know, uh, yeah, yeah. I feel like that, that story gets cut off in the middle. It gets cut off in the middle because people think that's the most important part. Yeah. But it's not. Watch the video. Anybody who's watching this, go see the Oven of Akhni video, Daff Reactions, the Oven of Akhni. Um, it is a very feminist take on this tale. Um, and also for more, a lot more demons and a lot more Jewish mythology, legends, stories, folklore, songs, and all these great characters, um, watch Jewish Lore Reactions, the Daff Reactions spinoff, which is going to cover all of that. Absolutely. Miriam, thank you for coming on Esoteric and chatting Gamara and Shadem with me. It's like, that's the best way to spend a, you know, a, a, a good morning is it chatting about this stuff. It truly is. This has been an absolute joy. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Where can people find you? Where, where, you can your find me where? on Instagram, on TikTok, on YouTube at Miriam Anzevin, and on Twitter, or the place formerly known as Twitter, uh, at Anzavina, um, and I'm posting everything that I create on all of those platforms. So please do come find me, come follow me, and let's learn some cool Jewish things together. Absolutely, I'm looking forward to the uh, the, the Jewish lore stuff as a person who also loves that material. So uh, yeah, we can definitely collaborate more if you want to get into the world of Jewish magic and and all yes. that stuff. Yes, there's so much good. Chaba de Moshe, the, so the Sword much. of Moses, such a cool. Oh like Jewish magical book. Uh, there's so many of these like great, uh, these great elements of, you know, part of my shtick is like, there's just all this great Jewish magical lore that we just avoid and don't talk about. Yeah. I'm like, if you want to get people back in shul, yeah, this. And this is a whole um, different conversation about why it's hidden and why it's forbidden right. and what historical context inside the community and external to the community force that to happen and why people don't know about it now unless they're yeah. very into it like we are yeah. um or if it's a part of their daily practice which it is for some jews who who do uh believe in certain things that i think maybe more jews in america wouldn't necessarily be aware of but that's not to say that people don't believe these things still and it's not a vital part of our understanding of judaism to this day so i would be delighted to talk about any of that stuff because it's just all so fascinating wonderful stuff great stuff all right miriam thank you so much for coming on thank folks make sure so to go much, Justin. absolutely go make sure to follow miriam on our socials you'll find the, the links down in the, the description and in the comments and uh yeah i wish you the very best with the the, the jewish law reactions thank you so much i'm very excited